Welcome back to Advertising is Dead. We talked to Anish. Um, Anish, I must tell you, you are one of the most well-prepared guests you've had in a long time. You you came in with with an act with this with a mic set up and, and all, all the things done. And we normally have to kind of scamper around to figure out uh, how to make the guests um, get in some Amazing. earphones. But you're the most prepared guest we've had uh, in Perfect. for a while. I will wait for my trophy. <laughs> yeah, I think that's going to be something I'm going to hand over to you offline. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy we're having this chat because I. You know, even sometime back um, on the other podcast I host called um, uh, Think Fast, you were talking about this entire segment right? and how it's really evolved over recent times. You obviously had large players on the Alco website. You also had a few players. I mean, I mean, I think minuscule number of players in this. The um, I mean, some call it mixer, some call it the non-alcohol segment. But um, but when you guys got into it at point at a point of there was nobody else really playing in this field. And obviously, there are many people there, but. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of get a perspective from you about how do you see this segment right now? How do you see this non-alcoholic segment? Um, um, and and how, what are you kind of what did you guys kind of experience, especially like I would say last two three years? I think uh, the segment looks a lot more exciting from the outside than <laughs> what it actually you know what the ground realities are. I guess that would uh, be for any business really. Uh, so the category is is developing for sure. Uh, at Swami, we have about 12 products now. So we are not only playing in the tonic water category. That category, I would say, is at the max about a 300, 350 crore a year sort of a market in India. And that category is predominantly linked to gin. You know, as long as, uh, as much as a lot of people think, no, tonics people can have by itself and stuff, uh, majority of it will be with gin then might be a little bit with vodka but predominantly it's gin gin is growing which is great but uh the other categories like the lemon based drinks those are huge uh, right uh, every brand like a pepsi coke has lemon products yeah. uh, so we are exploring a lot of other products as well and not only tonics tonic seems to be that thing that people in all our circles talk about mm-hmm. but if we look at india as a country uh, tonic would still be a smaller part of what a non-alcoholic beverage company can today make uh, in the country. I, I think that's an interesting point, right? Um, and, and I'm looking to the two most recent releases you guys had. Um, you obviously had the, the, the two Cal Cola um, and, and you had the salted lemonade. Yeah. Um, two very distinctly, um, I, I would associate with, okay, like you like mentioned, like Pepsi, uh, you know, Coke, etc. They, they're the guys who kind of get into spaces like these. Um, did you have to rethink how you approach um, building out these products and, and building them out under your brand when you had to do it? Considering Absolutely. how everything else worked before that. So for us, there was a lot of things to consider. We were very clear that at no point are we going to cheapen our brand. Mm-hmm. At no point to make a cheaper product, are we going to use, uh, let's say, artificial products, change to uh, inferior packaging. Like All of those things were out of the question. Um, but we were very clear that in Swami's journey, we have to have more affordable products. We started with tonics that are at 85, the tonics and the ginger ale. Uh, the zero proof range, the non-alcoholic rum and cola and two non-alcoholic gin and tonics, they're at 95. Mm-hmm. And we were very clear that our next range of products have to be lower. And then perhaps even a lower range than that, uh, price-wise. Uh, but quality cannot dip. Packaging cannot dip. Yeah. Uh, so then the whole... There, there were so many questions on this, right? Will will we be perceived as someone making cheaper products now or more inferior products now? Uh, if people discover us with a 65 rupees product, will a 85 rupee tonic then look too expensive to them? Mm. So a lot of these kind of things were considered, but what we realized is that your audiences can be very, very different. Mm. With the with the salted lemonade and the two cal cola, we're looking at entering a lot of tier two, tier three cities. For them, paying 20 rupees above a Diet Coke Hmm. is their premium right yeah if 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 it was 40 rupees above a diet coke we think we would have been too expensive hmm. and then we again would have been in the same smaller niche that we uh the the tonics plane yeah. uh the lemonade uh even the way these products were thought out right we knew we wanted to do a lemonade but what lemonade can we do with a will a elderflower lemonade be appealing to most people will they understand it uh, will people really understand a Gondraj lime thing on a mass level? And then to us, it was sorted lemonade, uh, sweet sorted uh, nimbu soda is like yeah. the most ordered drink perhaps in the country. Yeah. And uh, we weren't 
uh, happy with any similar product in the market. And we're like, okay, let's just build that out. It's a relatable product. We don't have to explain what this product is. And let's make sure it's at a lot more affordable price point. So these products are at 65 rupees. And eventually we are pretty sure that these products will come in uh, slightly cheaper and maybe in cans or other formats as well. I think that's really interesting right? because because you talk about day two and day three and I, and I feel what's really happening, I think especially, and I'd say over the last five odd years is that people across, not just day one, but I think day two and day three are looking for access. They're looking for access to stuff you should get in your major cities. Um, what everyone's also looking at, looking at how can I bring that, exp- I think bring that experience home while it's been in a conversation now, I think over the last two years, primarily because of, of all of us being um, stuck at home. But I think it was all, it, there was already a, a trend there. People are already kind of looking at that to an extent, but I don't know if that's um, how you guys saw it. And uh, so my long winded lead up to a question is basically that, um, how, how does this kind of bring, bring it down to, let's say, going full hog retail? Um, has digital played a part there as well? And, and so how, how have you been able to balance that out? So if I look at pre-pandemic, and right now it's so confusing to even remember which year the <laughs> pandemic started. Yeah, exactly. in. <laughs> but, uh, before, before the actual, the first uh, wave, the first lockdown, about uh, 80% of our revenue was uh, restaurants. Mm. And only about 20% was retail. Of course, since day one, since our first business plan, eventually over a period of three, four years, that changes more towards retail as any FMCG would. Mm. Uh, the the pandemic has just really accelerated that for us. So even last financial year, we still grew two times. Uh, retail grew like some 20 times. And I think digital and all has just accelerated everything. But I have one slight difference in the craze I say about D2C. I do think for a brand, at least like us, offline retail is extremely important. Mm. I don't think we can be an Amazon first or a... Uh, online first sort of a brand uh, because people do want the products quick Uh, and people because again if if you look at some of our products that are linked more to alcohol consumption you don't buy alcohol two three days in advance a lot of times your stuff is bought for the the party you're having today or you know when people are coming over so as much as uh, amazon and everything helps for us our offline uh, distribution has picked up a lot more and when when you look at that, do you also see uh, that the consumers change? Do you, do you feel that have you seen the consumers, especially when you guys started off? Um, and I want to get to how you guys started off. I think it's a very interesting story. But um, uh, have you seen the consumer change from the time you guys started off to now? Just in terms of you guys came in, say, okay, this is the kind of people um, our consumers are going to be like. But how how has that evolved? So I think when we started, we did not do too much consumer research or any of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so Swami is me, Rahul and Sahil and uh, Sahil doesn't drink. He's a teetotaler. Mm. Uh, Rahul and I, I think, uh, easily compensate for his not drinking. <laughs> but I think for us, when we started, the whole thing was that we believed in the products we had to make because in our circles, people wanted an alternative product to wash webs and that wasn't there. Mm. Or, or, you know, when we saw what was happening abroad, uh, if you had a restaurant with 50 gins, you also had 20 mixers uh, as options. And again, in India, it was only uh, Schweppes that was available. We also knew what was happening in the gin space. Rahul, of course, is involved with Stranger and Sons. I know the Greater Than uh, team really, really well. So we, we knew what everyone was building uh, uh, before they'd even launched. And for us, we thought that, okay, we know that there is a certain amount of audience that is at least going to drink gin. Mm. So the tonics will work. Let's wet our feet with this and then see which products to launch uh, in at what time. So when we started, our predominant consumers would have been gin drinkers. Mm. Today, that's expanded to a lot more people. You don't only have to be a gin drinker to be a Swami consumer. There are a lot of people who don't drink alcohol. Uh, Gujarat for us is a very interesting state. Gujarat is doing a decent amount of revenue for us. Uh, smaller cities like Asurat, uh, a lot of uh, cafes keep us. So I think the audience has changed from, or rather, you know, initially it was limited to more of gin drinkers. Mm-hmm. Today it is, we are targeting anyone above 21, 22, uh, who wants to just have a tasty drink. 
And that for us is the idea of building Swami that you should be having a tasty drink doesn't mean that it has to have alcohol in it necessarily. Um, how did you get into this space? I, I know you started off, um, I mean, you were a photographer for a while and, um, um, and, and at some point you transitioned to hospitality and, and, and the alcohol wave industry. But and how did that happen? How did you go from one to the other? And how did this? So, um, so I came to Bombay to study photography. I ended up teaching at the same institute right after my uh, course got over. After that, started working, uh, started freelancing. And I really got lucky. Uh, or I think I was at the right place at the right time. I ended up shooting a lot for travel magazines. Uh, I've shot for Condonas, Traveler. I've shot for uh, Lonely Planet. Uh, some of those assignments were to places like, let's say, New Zealand or South Africa, where you know, you've got to go to vineyards and stuff. Mm. And then I got commissioned to shoot for a book on the Indian alcohol industry. Right. And because of that book, I literally had to travel to every winery in Nasik to photograph the place, meet the owners. And a lot of them were just obliged with a wine tasting. And I had no taste at all. You could have given me a 30-year-old whiskey and I would have added a thumbs up to it and had it. Uh, that, that was my uh, uh, sense of drinking at that point. But it just seemed interesting that, okay, this this seems like a new hobby one can really get into and you know just trying to figure out what the fuss was and i still remember i went for i'd want to shoot uh, take a portrait of this one person for the same book and when i went to their office all of them were tasting wine hmm. but they were tasting wine that had gone bad and i was okay. like man this is really interesting why are people on a friday evening sitting and tasting wines that have gone bad and they're like this is how you realize what off notes in wines can be and I think that was a turning point where I was like, okay, I really need to understand this more because it just seems like a very complex hobby to get into. And I think that's where alcohol, the whole interest in alcohol really started. Uh, being a photographer again, I ended up shooting for Diageo. Uh, I shot a whole campaign for Hennessy back in the day. Mm. And now we worked with Hennessy at a product yeah. level. So that to me is really, really, it's like a nice uh, circle. But uh, I got a lot of exposure to alcohol brands because of photography as well. Mm. So somewhere that also remained and because of the wine uh, uh, keenness and, you know, that becoming a hobby, me and Sheila uh, started uh, an app called Hipcask. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Hipcask is where I think we really just kept in touch with more in the beverage space. And I think from there, Swami was a very natural evolution. Um. And, and how, how did how, how did Swami happen? How did how did all of you all sit? I know, I know you mentioned that all of you were in the space and you saw this as an opportunity, but uh, was the initial idea, um, like I alluded to earlier, it started off with coffee, right? Coffee was... Yeah, so so the first product was coffee. Uh, Sahil, Sahil is my brother-in-law. Hmm. Uh, he was in the coffee space and uh, he was in Singapore for two, three years. And uh, he was telling me that, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting with uh, a coffee product uh, that I want to package in Singapore. And I was like, okay, how about you think of India? Could be a much larger space to play in and perhaps I can also uh, uh, work with you on that. Uh, till this moment, Sal and I would have never, ever spoken about doing anything together. Mm. And uh, Rahul, I got to know because of uh, home brewing and mm. Rahul started Gateway Brewing Company. So you know that whole uh, there, there was this whole home brewers community in Bombay. So the first time I met Rahul, I think it was we had about eighty pints of home brewed beer at his house. Oh, wow. So uh, that's how Rahul and I really became friends. And I, 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 I was getting a beer with Rahul, and just I was telling him, you know, Sahil has an idea to do something with coffee. Uh, I was telling him, let's uh, perhaps do that in India, and not only coffee, we could look at mixers as well. Yeah. And in that conversation, Rahul was like, you know what, I want to be a part of this. Let's do this together because I'm super keen on getting into the non-alcoholic space. And it was literally just that. Uh, Rahul and Sail had never met earlier or spoken earlier. Uh, we met a few times. And what was really, really good was that all three of us brought a different aspect uh, to the company. Yeah. Uh, Rahul had set up Gateway Brewing Company from scratch, so he knew how to set up a facility. Uh, Silent managed ops in his coffee business earlier, and he came with all of that uh, 
uh, experience and I had worked a lot with alcohol brands because of Ipcas. Uh, so I knew at least some part of the marketing side and the advocacy side of things. Uh, and that's how three of us came together and uh, Swami was started. But we were very clear that we will build a portfolio of non-alcoholic drinks. It won't only be a coffee or a tonic or something like that. Uh, we were clear that tonic would be the first product, but that took a while. You know, initially we were like, how difficult will a tonic water be? <laughs> um, and uh, uh, mostly, not mostly, everyone in our space in, in India, apart from us, uh, goes to a contract manufacturer and gets the product made. So we went to this main contract manufacturer in Pune. We're like, we want to make tonic water. They're like, yeah, tell us what quantity you want and we'll make it. That's about it. And we're like, you know what? Let's do this ourselves. Let's make the recipe ourselves because ultimately we're all getting almost the same product as whatever was already in the market. You'll do one minor tweak or add one more flavor to it and that's about it. But let's build this completely ourselves. And that's when we realized that maybe it's not that simple to develop a, a, a recipe. It took us six months just to find the right quinine. Quinine is what gives tonic uh, its bitterness. Yeah. And we got quinine from all parts of the world, wherever in India we could get quinine from Myanmar. Uh, that process itself was a good six, eight month long process. And till then, Sal was like, we already have coffee expertise. Mm. We already have a lot of com common equipment at the factory that can be used for making nitro coffee. Uh, let's launch with cold brew coffee. And we're like, yeah, why not? We launch it and we'll see how it goes. Uh, we did have a hunch that it'll be 10 of us drinking and feeling happy about it. And that's where the market size might end. Uh, and that's exactly how it was. Uh, so we had some fun with coffee, kept ourselves busy till tonic was launched. I think the moment the tonics were ready to go, the coffee was just scrapped. Hmm. But yeah, we did uh, start with coffee initially. Um, yeah. This building it yourself, I think, is an interesting point. Right? Um, like you said, most, I'd say most modern brands these days, um, I look at most D2C, right? You look at it in personal care, you look at it in this industry. You have a set of manufacturers available. You do a plug and play. You you change some ingredients around. You talk to them about what, um, you know, what variations they have available and you go with that. Um, you guys decided to go this way to do it Um you know, by yourselves, you know, you, you have your own, let's say, a manufacturing unit, you have your own R&D. Um, so when you look at that now, after uh, after these years, um, what do you feel is kind of, what do you think that's done to the brand? What do you think that's done just from a consumer standpoint? What is it done from a business standpoint uh, for you guys? So I think for a consumer, initially, it may not make too much of a difference till you really get to know a brand really, really well. But what it's done for us from an industry point of view and a product point of view, one is, of course, R&D. And from day one, uh, complete R&D has been internally, uh, done internally, not through a third-party consultant uh, uh, sort of a way. Uh, it's given us absolute control over our products. Uh, if we wanted, uh, when we were launching Swami, I actually flew to uh, L.A., for 24 hours to pick up a specific ingredient that we were mm -hmm. only able to source from one uh, vendor uh, in the US. Mm -hmm. I literally spent more time on the flight than I did in LA to get that <laughs> product back. And we could do a lot of those kind of things because we had complete control over our manufacturing. And it's not like from day one, we had this more state of the art thing. It was all manual when we started. Only now we have a pretty uh, uh, good setup uh, that way. But it gave us a lot of opportunities opportunity to experiment you know we can do smaller batches i can do a hundred bottle batch uh, yeah. and you know not worry about a twenty thousand case moq from a manufacturer uh -huh. so it gives us room to innovate a lot we taste at least 10 new products on a monthly basis uh, uh -huh. at an r&d level we've already planned like we at least have 40 rec ready recipes to go if uh -huh. we were to launch new products it gives us a lot of room to do stuff like that and it gives us even when it comes to things like collaborations, right? Uh, uh, the project we did with uh, Moet Hennessy in there. Mm, yeah. uh, something like this could have never come through if we were not a manufacturer ourselves. Yeah. Uh, uh, then it they would have actually worked with a contract manufacturer and done a, you know, like a target sort of a product perhaps. 
But uh, a lot of the collaborations that we've been able to pull off, partnerships won't even be possible if we didn't have complete control over what we do. And I do see, and and I know this is the new uh, playbook, right, for D2C especially. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it can work in a lot of sectors. But I think, again, for us, having our own facility, it's just these key things. It's And it's not like we'll manufacture everything ourselves for the next 10 years. Mm. Some things can be outsourced at certain points, right? Yeah. Uh, but at least you have your co-facility to manage certain products and keep innovating because what might be relevant two years down the line, we don't know yet. But we rather be prepared uh, well in time than, you know, try and copy someone else later down the line. You know, you mentioned the collab with, uh, with Moe Hennessy, right? Um, and you also done one with, with Bira sometime recently as yeah. well. Um, and, and, if, and if I... Am, there are two of those. And also, you do a lot of these small batches of, of recipes, uh, which sometimes there are people like me who will say, okay, why have you stopped? Why can't you get why can't you get more of those as well? I mean, those have happened many times. Uh, so when you look at those, how do you how do you kind of differentiate? Okay, what's going to be a good small batch? Let's try this one out. And and where do you kind of go towards making it long term? Because this whole it's almost like you're taking drop culture and put it into like uh, what yeah. into the non-alcohol yeah. segment? You do. I, I would associate this with sneakers or, or with clothes. You just done this to, yeah. to a segment which I've never seen that happen with as much. So, what's the thought behind that? So I'll tell you. Uh, actually, all three things have worked very differently. Uh, so during the first lockdown, uh, like most companies, we didn't have too much work, and we're like, how do we support restaurants and bars without us giving them cash? We're not a larger Diageo Perno that can just give out cash. Uh, what can we perhaps do uh, for the industry? So we came up with a competition that any restaurant in the country could take part in, uh, whether they were a Swami account or not. In fact, we explicitly put this on our website that if you have a Schweppes exclusive contract, you can still enter. We are not mm-hmm. here to, you know, there's not a hard sell for our product. And uh, we gave away about 8 lakhs of cash that we raised from sponsorships to winners of the, of the competition. And the number one, uh, uh, so there were three main winners, but the the, the first winner, uh, they got to co-create a product with us. And we like mm-hmm. the winner will get to co-create a ginger ale with us. And this is going to be a part of the competition that you have to conceptualize the product. Mm-hmm. You have to tell us how will you sell the product? How will you sell it to your customers? How What do you think we'll put on a retail shelf? And the Jamun ginger ale, which was a limited edition, was mm-hmm. genuinely, you know, it was born out of that. And uh, Jamun Ginger Ale, like there was a proper pitch by PCO, why Jamun, how it should be done. They made mock labels and they ultimately won and we co-created with them. And that product's coming back in April. We've actually got a very good demand for that product. Perfect timing because mine just got my, 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 whatever stock I had amassed because I, I, I I like, I love Ginger Ale in general. Um, And I've. I'd kept that for like a rainy day and I've just ended up finishing that batch. Yeah. So, so, so that, that, that's going to come back as a proper product in April because uh, we were a little surprised by the offline demand for that. Mm-hmm. A lot of shops have asked for that product. And this again made us rethink that we should look at some Indian flavors, right? Again, mm-hmm. for me, I would rather do a jamun than an elderflower because to me, an elderflower looks like a very small mm-hmm. uh, segment, whereas a jamun can have a lot bigger appeal. So that's how something like this collab happened. Uh, something like a Moet Hennessy project was so different. And uh, we were really, really uh, surprised when the talk started because uh, from what I know, uh, globally, LVMH has never worked with a mixer company before mm. to co-create something. Mm. And a brand like uh, Glenn Morangi, Belvedere Hennessy, these are not just small brands, right? They, these are brands that have absolute global uh, uh, acclaim. So the this came out of the fact that lockdown had hit. Uh, even uh, alcohol companies were like home consumption is what we all need to focus on. And uh, the team at Moet Hennessy India, uh, uh, Sophia had called me from their team and said, you know what, do you think we can even pull something like this off that we co-create uh, three mixers, especially for these three brands? And it was a good one year in the making, uh, the project. And I think the products are going to remain till the end of this year. Awesome. And and hopefully, perhaps we'll do something more with them after that. Uh, perhaps do a refresh of the flavors. Uh, 
so for us from a collab point of view the jamun ginger ale was a very local restaurant you know built collab uh, mohit hindesi was like the top 3 4 global alcohol company sort of a level international level mm-hmm. of a uh, collab and the beera was us just you know working with another cool indian beverage brand and beera some beera's a brand i love and yeah. i really love what ankur has built uh, over the last few years it's not easy to you know you look at beera now and it's so obvious that yeah this would have worked weed beer and this and that but it's not easy how many I brands agree. have tried to do weed beer and you know they've not gone anywhere in fact there were so many brands that launched around beera but mm. they know where they're now so the moment ankur said uh, should we look at doing uh, a product at the tap room Uh, like hundred percent, yes. Uh, let's definitely do that. Ideally, I would have gone to their Mysore brewery, but again, uh, pandemic situation. So that product came out really, really well. That was more of a hyper local sort of a uh, collab. It was only at the Bira Tap Room in Bangalore. But to me, it was just that you know, these are two uh, more contemporary Indian beverage brands coming together, and slightly unusual. You wouldn't have expected us. to be working with a beer brand perhaps yeah 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 and there's also the, the recent one you guys did which i thought was again very interesting correct right? with, with the one with uh, the, the maradona edition um, the maradona yeah so so for me that is the drop culture like the, yeah. the maradona one is a, is a pure uh, uh, like a different colorway of sorts right how yeah, we yeah. would have with yeah. sneakers yeah. so different label again the idea here was uh, when we got talking to amazon prime that let's not do a tonic uh, let, let let let's do a product that is more uh, understandable at a larger scale mm. and uh, we think cola for that hit well because sports we think cola can work better in those sort of scenarios yeah and uh, we we worked uh, on a label change for the two cal cola with them <coughs> and, and and i think that's a unique one right? I, i haven't seen something like that happened for a, a show or a property in a while so how how, do, how yeah so let's kind of take it's a step like, back and say how does how does something like that come about how do, how do you guys kind of was that something that they got in touch with you for do you guys chat to them how does this happen i think it was over uh, uh, i think their team had spoken to us about something on instagram i'm not 100% sure about <laughs> what the initial conversation around yeah. this was but the idea originally was that okay uh, since this is football mm. uh, from their point of view Um, for amazon i think it was more like can we put the maradona's uh, poster mm. on something that's available at stores yeah. or restaurants yeah. for people to see and for us it was okay this sounds really cool from a community point of view can we tap into a new community can we tap into a football community because we've usually not done that yeah. uh if 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 we were not in the uh, Uh, in the covid situation again we were planning to do let's say football screenings at pubs mm. you know again our product and fits there really really well yeah. and for amazon prime again their show is getting promoted so uh, for us a lot of this to do was with offline activation but now again yeah we do that when we do that yeah. but but i think it, it's cool to reach for us it's reaching out to the football community which otherwise we didn't know how we would have possibly uh, done I have a bunch more questions to ask you, but I know I've been prompted that I need to go in for a break. Uh, so just going to do that. Meet okay. back with advertising is dead. Welcome back to advertising is dead. We're still talking to Anish. Um, you know, I want to kind of take this into a slightly different direction, right? I want to say that uh, when you look at that kind of team you guys have assembled, um, who work with you and who work with the with the company, um, and you know, many people listen to this podcast want to work in in different sectors. Uh, this is obviously a sector everybody finds is going to be super. Um, it, It's associated with, with being a fun sector to work with. Um, a, I don't know if that's a myth you want to kind of cross off, cross off. But um, what do you kind of look for when when you look for people to hire? Uh, bring in what kind of skill sets? Uh, what kind of people really do well in this space? Uh, it is definitely a fun space. Uh, I can definitely vouch uh, for that. Uh, you play hard and you work hard, of course. Uh, I think for a brand like ours or anyone who's uh building an alcohol or a non alcoholic beverage brand right and there are a lot of them happening so if you're looking for opportunities there are a lot of opportunities in the space currently i think uh we would really or at least what uh, we at swami or i am in my team looking for is that we need people to come with very very 
solid ideas of mm-hmm. execution because a lot of it is you know these days that i'm hearing that we'll do this online and we'll run this ad and boom but how do you build an offline again i'm saying offline because to me are a lot of our business is offline sales mm-hmm. uh, it's not going to be a uh online sale predominant business at least for the next 2 3 years ultimately what drives someone to pick up a product from a retail store or what makes someone order a swami at a restaurant how do we solve this at every possible level whether it is creating a uh, scarcity perhaps with a limited edition product mm-hmm. or is it launching a collab with with an amazon or it is actually doing a very basic menu promotion at a restaurant right everything has to work together and sales and marketing really has to work together and i think that is one thing that sometimes gets lost because uh a lot of times marketing and sales in smaller companies or startups uh may not be in sync and i think whoever joins the teams has to make sure that they're working with the other teams really really well uh and just getting feedback right like if you're doing a certain activity what's the roi on that like how do you sit and calculate that because a lot of these things today are not that easy to pinpoint and calculate so i think when we are looking at people we're looking at people who can think in a 360 sort of a way and help out in with whatever they possibly can um, and i think also the interesting about just generally and and and, and this is i think i'm kind of circling back to one of the things you started off with that is that um people look at this industry as a bunch of different segments one they look at one thing as being extremely mass and one thing as being premium and this goes for everything right i mean i'm i'm talking about even when you look at someone like a um you know like a pepsi or a coke there are there are some parts that some looked at as extremely mass or otherwise um you guys are kind of maintain that you are somewhere you are, you are neither pushing yourself to be too massy neither are you like extreme premium in that sense of the word um and as yeah. you add more segments in there um and 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 i was reading a recent uh, i think an interview all of you all did where you spoke about even something like an energy drink being something that you guys are thinking yeah, about um absolutely. as you get into all those spaces um there is a certain brand you kind of built out so if you had to look at say, okay these are things which you would definitely always kind of keep as part of the brand um and these are things which we which you which you added in specifically for specific product ranges how would you kind of differentiate that so we are very clear that we want to play in the mass premium segment uh even if i look at give you the example again of the salted lemonade mm. we could have launched the lemonade at 85 we could have launched the lemonade at 95 but our whole thing was our products have to especially a product like a lemonade has to be a lot more affordable yeah. than a 85 rupee price point uh we are we see ourselves playing from a range starting at 45 to about 95 and again a larger portfolio to address all sorts of uh, uh products in those those categories like energy drink for example i see no reason to compete with red bull at a 95 and a 105 rupee price point mm. uh, i'd rather have a energy drink that's at 75 or 65 but be really really tasty and delicious rather than trying to replicate that high octane high energy sort of a vibe that's yeah. at least not what we are aiming for our energy drink to be at so uh i think it's just important to see what product can fit at what price point mm. i do think if we were to for example make the tonics uh 65 mm. i think there we might be cheapening the product mm. but if we make the salted lemonade 85 i don't think we're making it more premium i think we're just making it niche so you you can you can be very premium at 65 uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, ultimately we we want to be about 15 20 rupees more expensive than a super mass product so if a diet coke is at 40 we want to be at 60 65 yeah. uh, even with tonics by the way and a lot of people don't realize this there's 40% gst on carbonated <laughs> beverages uh, that's Just, a lot of gst yeah. so so when when we were doing our initial pricing uh, that time it was sales tax gst not come in mm. sales tax was about 18% mm. so schweps was at 50 or 55 rupees with 18% tax and we would have been at about 70 75 rupees but when gst came in it became 
that 18% became 40%. Schweppes did not change their pricing. Mm. They idly should have, but they didn't. And we're like, there is no ways we can still that 70 rupees price point because margins will really go bad. We want to be 20 rupees more than Schweppes or whichever category we're playing in. We're very clear about that. Uh, even when we're in a market abroad, let's say uh, we're in Singapore and we're doing really well in Singapore, hmm. hypothetically, and that's not the case, but I would not want to be cheaper on a shelf against any other international brand and have someone buy me because we are cheaper. Hmm. I don't want that to be the plug at all. Like even if I'm at a Singapore, I have to be at least the same price as a fever tree or perhaps slightly more expensive if required, if that's how the pricing works. But we are not going to play on a price game. Uh, even when you go abroad that where an Indian product might be cheaper. So we might sell more. So pricing for us will always be key. And you want, you want to be that, you want to have that little bit of aspiration uh, value to the product. Uh, you, know, you, you, you mentioned international markets and, 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 and I think, both internationally and locally, one strong partner we end up having to focus on is um, restaurants and bars and everybody else, right? And, and how you kind of seen that, Marish? Obviously, you spoke about what you kind of did in the early days of COVID, uh, you know, and what came out of that. Um, but over time, what have you seen at companies like yours? Because you you are partners in many in in so many cases. Um, how is that? How does that relationship really play out in really being able to? So this is, these are things which we do as a brand. Or do as a company because we are, you know, this is an entire industry which is almost like plugged in with us, and they then yeah. we plugged in with them. Um, so how how does that dynamic really play into um, things you decide, things you kind of move towards? Uh, so, I think our third or fourth hire was uh, our brand ambassador, and you know, in beverages or especially alcohol, brand ambassador is not a celebrity brand ambassador, but someone who. Uh, is talking to other bartenders uh, about your brand, doing trainings, making hotel uh, restaurant staff try the products. And uh, I think Jatin, our brand ambassador, he was the third or fourth person we hired before the product had even launched. And we followed this playbook that a lot of alcohol brands have typically followed. Even Beeras followed the same playbook that you do your samplings and you first build your brand at restaurants and bars because their sampling becomes easier rather than someone buying a case of your product or spending five, 600 rupees, they're just spending about 100, 120 rupees and having it with their gin or whatever your pro product might be. Uh, for us, that has played a very crucial role. Uh, what we'll call brand advocacy. Uh, that has happened meticulously well. Every, every bar that we are served in, in a larger city, Bombay, Delhi, Goa, Bangalore, Chennai, every staff has gone through a Swami training, which has never happened for a non-alcoholic brand in the country. Like, yeah. like, like when we would do a training and, uh, and early days, I've done a lot of those tasting uh, trainings and tastings myself. Uh, staff would not know what is tonic water versus soda. Now your, wow. your weight staff at a regular place may not even know what the difference is. Mm. And we would actually make them try the products and do it to a proper detail, right? Make sure the products are cold for them to try uh, and we would actually make them try a Schweppes and our light tonic side by side yeah. and just see their reaction because they never realized how much sugar, for example, there was in a Schweppes. So to us, we, we built our brand with Horeca, with restaurants and bars mm. and training and making the bar team understand what our product is, has been extremely crucial. Uh, so advocacy for us, uh, is how we basically started building the brand out. And it's a lot more powerful when a bartender recommends my product than anyone else. He's ultimately, he or she is ultimately your best spokesperson. If you were sitting at a bar and ordering and someone said, no, uh, you have to have it with Swami, you, 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 you will give that some weight. Oh, sure. I think that's, I think that form of advocacy also, it's, it's almost like this is true blue authentic influencing versus what is, other form of influencer culture, I would say, because, you know, in some ways, the, the bartender yeah. makes a wrong call for other reasons, you know, the fact that drink might not taste the way it needs to taste. So I think that's, yeah. that's super interesting, just kind of look at it from that lens. Um, what, what keep, what's exciting for you as you look ahead towards where 
um, the entire space is going where where, where Swami is going. What's what trends you're spotting? Because I know that um, you also do kind of talk about what trends happening in the broader space as well. So, uh, what's what's looking exciting for you um, as you look ahead? Uh, I think what's going to be exciting over the next two three years is going to be a lot more white spirits. I do think uh, uh, tequila and spirits like those uh, should get a lot more popular. I don't think the gin wave is going to die anytime soon. I think you'll see at least another 10, 15 brands out of Goa itself over the next year. Yeah. So uh, a lot of white spirit consumption. And I think a lot of uh, uh, brown spirit consumption, but in cocktails or highball forms, not so much uh, perhaps on ice. So a lot more highballs is, I think, how a lot of whiskey brands are going to push their products out as well. In the non-alcoholic space, again, I think there's going to be, at least uh, for us, a lot of focus on seasonal uh, products, Mm -hmm. on seasonal ingredients and local ingredients. And I think there's a lot to be explored uh, on that side of things, rather than going to an elderflower or a more uh, international sort of a flavor. Like uh, even with Moet Hennessy, one of the products we made was a pomelo soda. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know about uh, too many other cities, but in Bombay, till a couple of months back when it was season time, there are pomelo carts everywhere. Hmm. And it's just something we never looked at earlier. So I think there's a lot of local produce to explore. And uh, that'll be an F&B uh, as a trending thing for sure. Um. And I'm kind of going back to the point you made about energy drinks as well, right? Um, you're also seeing this trend globally, and, and and this is me entirely just like going through Dwayne Johnson's feed, and that only talks about one energy drink maybe in my head. Um, but um, we haven't had anything which is distinctive, and and I like the fact that you spoke about it's not just about because you 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 hear you hear about Red Bull, you hear about Monster, you hear about Monster, but you everything else feels like the same like i can't differentiate any yeah. of the other brands at all I, I if you ask me today to name any other brand i can't um even though you go to a supermarket there's an entire shelf full of that um so i, I think even that space like since you mentioned it i was thinking about the fact that we don't have enough of those uh so, in in so many ways yeah and we're looking at energy in a very different way we don't want to be a red bull or a monster replica of sorts uh, i personally don't like the taste too much uh, the way, yeah. uh either but what we are developing is a product that you could have right now on a Wednesday afternoon at two, that can be your pick me up. Hmm. And uh, we don't expect people to go jump off a cliff after having our product, but just a nice, nice pick me up. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, jumping off a cliff, uh, you know, to, the last part of, this, of the show is always me asking my guests a set of random questions. Um, um, nothing to do with what you spoke about so far, but I have a feeling for you some of them might kind of cross pollinate across. Um, what do you spend a lot of time doing um, outside of all the stuff you do with Swami um, that keeps you excited um, beyond the uh, beyond the industry that you work in? I think just uh, so many hobbies, man. Uh, a lot of uh, music, vinyl, hmm. uh, sneakers, cigars. Uh, I think just I, I for me again, I think Swami is born out of a hobby, and I think I have a lot of hobbies that really keep me busy. Um, I also noticed that you have a, you have an interesting take on on reels on Instagram, which I which, which I think is is something which I always enjoy kind of following. That um, yeah. you have you have a, a I, I I love to hate you relationship with Instagram. I do uh, in, in the, the way I put it. In the last month, it's been more love than hate because again, uh. I knew if if you can't beat them, you join them. But uh, what's working well for me is that I'm seeing a lot less people dancing on reels. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, that's true. Uh, which is fine for me. And my whole thing is you please dance, do whatever you want. I don't want Instagram to force fully make me watch that, yeah. which I think is happening lesser, at least for me. So that's great. Um, what can you put together in an instant? In an instant, I can put together a really good tasting drink. Um, anything you uh, read, watched or listened to recently that you'd recommend? Uh, very, very random recommendation. Uh, I don't read too many books. I did order your book yesterday, by the way. I think that's coming on 9th of Feb. Congratulations on that. Uh, I, 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 I don't end up reading too many books because I think I don't have the attention span to do it. But one book that I just picked up randomly, uh, is Court Decisions by Arun Shori. 
Mm-hmm. A very random recommendation. It talks about how a lot of uh, how basically the law can work in our country, and just the first chapter gave me goosebumps. Just yeah. hearing his personal journey on the cases he's fighting even uh, now, or that are against him. So, just something very different. I don't think a lot of us we really talk about laws and how a lot of these things work in our country, but uh, very interesting book to read. And um, so. my last question is generally a, a spin on the name of the show and i'm trying to think about uh, what can i ask you why do you think i need to build distinct products in markets where everything feels like the same not die because i think we ourselves want to have better products right or better choices and i can speak about beverages because it's so linked to food we we always want better food choices right uh, mm. i and and you'll hear all of us script that you know where do we order from it's only five places it's only 10 places i think we generally as humans want enough options for f and b and i don't think that's going to change whether it's alcoholic non alcoholic veg non veg dessert savory like that'll always be there we'll always want more choices thank you tan man thank thanks for coming on 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 the show i've, I've had a My pleasure. We need to do this for a while, and I'm and I'm happy we finally got to do this. Um, please keep making the jamun ginger ale. Um, and, yes, and that's coming back. That yeah, uh, and looking forward to um, your own version of uh, of of Zoa energy drink, if if that's what, uh, or maybe something entirely different. You, I don't know. You 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 shall get a prototype. Yes, I I I I, uh, I think I've just. I I watch way too much Dwayne Johnson on Instagram I should really stop doing that but yeah. more than anything else just keep doing the amazing things that you guys do I I think you created a very distinct brand and it, and and every time you come with an innovation you like it makes sense why did no someone not do that first um and um, yeah I'm look forward to seeing all the new releases and everything else coming up thank you so much thank you for having me I V M